Good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. It's Reverend Paul J. Byrne with uh, Progressive Christian Ministries of Greater Atlanta. And I'm very happy that you've taken the, the next few minutes here to join me for this latest commentary about the, uh, just in general, about the, uh, the ongoing presidential election and all the politics that's involved and how it ties in with the Bible and the way in which we try to live out the instructions that are contained within it. This week's commentary is called simply Five Biblical Concepts Our Political Leaders Just Don't Understand. Five concepts, clueless. That's what I'm here to talk about for the next few minutes, people. Right-wing evangelical fundamentalism, as well as much of America's conservative uh, political leadership, or those aspiring to be so, claims to uh, return to the roots of Christianity. Now, few of these fundamentalists care much about the early church, real Christianity. They don't care much about the four Gospels or the Apostle Paul's letters or St. Augustine for that matter. Rather, they blend Southern conservatism, Southern U.S. conservatism, pardon me, what I will call bastardized Protestantism combined with Aryan heresies, gross nationalism, and a heavy dose of pretty naive intellectualism for a peculiar American strain of what I will tactfully call spiritual sophistry. As a pastor by the name of Reverend Cornell West has noted not too, uh, not too long ago, the fundamentalist Christians want to be fundamental about everything except love thy neighbor. I could not agree more with that assessment. So I decided to make that this week's commentary. I use that word because I never liked the word sermon. It seems like too stiff or too formal to me. But at any rate, here are some verses that we progressive Christians, or if you like, more liberal Christians, wish our politicians would get more fundamentalist about. Number one, immigration. The verses, the verse rather in this case, is as follows. When a stranger, stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as a native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. That is from Leviticus uh, chapter 19, verses 33 to 34. That particular one was the King James Version. I'm going to use a couple different, different versions over the next several minutes here. Now, bogus Christians hate this verse because these fundamentalists, as they love to call themselves, are almost universally xenophobic. The truth of the matter is, religious fundamentalism is only a reaction to the multiculturalism excuse me, of a liberal democracy, and particularly in multicultural churches. Rather than seeking a brotherhood of man, or brotherhood of humankind, religious fundamentalism longs for a colonial style community without the necessary friction from those with foreign beliefs or cultures or foreign customs and especially with different skin colors. Especially with different skin colors. We are called to discern among these sojourners, as the King James called it, calls it, 
the original meaning of this, of this word in this context is those who move about from place to place. This looks like, to me, a euphemism for what some would call illegal immigrants. Still others for, say, homeless people, for example. People looking for a home have been around ever since humankind began to explore the earth. And by the way, the new international version of the Bible translates sojourners as aliens, which has a more familiar ring to it. There are currently uh, 11 million illegal immigrants who want to become citizens with likely an addi additional 20 million family members as new citizens within about a decade or so from now. What does God say about those who hate without cause and mistreat foreigners? He says, I will be swift, a swift witness against those who oppress the hired worker and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and against those who thrust aside the sojourner and who do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. That's from the book of Malachi, chapter 3 and verse 5, by the way. Saying King James Version. The second thing that they have, uh, that the fundamentalists have a big problem with that we need to set the record straight about is poverty. The verse says, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's Matthew chapter 19 and verse 24. And then the other one is from the, the, uh, the book of James towards the back of the New Testament. <coughs> Excuse me. Now listen, you rich people. That's rich with an R. <laughs> Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted. And moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosions will testify against you. And they will eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. And that is James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, by the way, is where that quote came from. And that translation was the NIV as well. Now, to myself at least, uh, and this is just me, well, maybe it's not just me, but one of the most absolutely hilarious aspects of modern day far right Christianity is its reverence for capitalism. That's because Christ could be considered anti capitalist as well as Moses. If you want to look up the part about Moses, see the book of Exodus, chapter 22, verses 25 through 27. Consider that there is some version of the story of a rich man approaching Jesus that appears in every gospel. In the gospel of Mark, for example, Jesus tells the rich man, go, he said, go, Sell all that you have and give it all to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. That is the Lord. Uh, that is Mark chapter 10 and verse 21, by the way. The story of Lazarus. Same Gospels. Should similarly terrify modern-day fundamentalists. 
Lazarus is a beggar who waits outside of a rich man's house and begs for scraps in the Bible. That's what that's uh that's what the poor guy did. He's probably like disabled or something. When both Lazarus and the rich man die, Lazarus ends up in heaven, while the rich man ends up in hell. And when the rich man begs for water, Abraham from up, from, up, from up in heaven says, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received good things and that Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. Luke 19 and 25. For those who want to look that up. So-called conservative Christians, as they so love to call themselves, the very term is an oxymoron. Conservative Christian doesn't ring true to me. They hate these verses because the only thing fundamentalists dislike more than those illegal immigrants I mentioned a minute ago is poor people. Seriously. Poor people. A former Tea Party congressman, he's no longer in Congress, once said he thought the government should cut food stamps entirely. He said the role of Christian of citizens and of Christians and of humanity is to take care of each other, but not for Washington to steal from those in the in the country and give to others in the country. Uh, evidently, this individual had a very broad-based definition of stealing, more so than myself. You know, of that you can be sure. Former uh, Congressional Representative Michelle Bachman has also made similar statements. The entire Tea Party movement was based on the idea that a huge portion of Americans are takers who suck the lifeblood out of the economy. Never mind the fact that the reason all those people aren't working is because their jobs got exported overseas for pennies on the dollar, leaving them destitute. The majority of Christian fundamentalists insist that poverty can be explained in terms of a personal moral failure, or even mass incompetence, for heaven's sake, if such a thing were possible. They, therefore, hold that success should be described in terms of morality, when in fact the Bible says quite the opposite. In the last days, the Bible says, many will compare godliness with gain. That was written by the Apostle Paul, in case anybody wants to know who wrote that. The poor are considered culpable, so they can be punished. Like today's cuts to food stamps, or the public shaming of those on disability, or welfare, or unemployment. The third uh, item that our political candidates and our country's leaders have lost sight of, pardon me, is the environment. The verses are, first, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. And then the second quote I will use is from the New Testament. By him, that is God, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. 
moving right along. Why, oh why, do so many fundamentalists twist and distort these verses? In Genesis, man is given stewardship of the earth, which was God's creation. Now, stewardship in the Christian tradition implies protection. It implies husbandry. Man should exist in harmony with the earth, not work against it. Jesus Christ once told his followers, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the former. You cannot serve both God and money. Luke chapter 16, verse 13. Increasingly, the religious right, which is neither, by the way, neither, is trying to do exactly this, exactly that, pardon me. The intertwining um, evangelical uh, fundamentalism with unfettered capitalism with disastrous results for the earth's environment, number one, and number two for the United States job market. Thus, American political life is increasingly dominated by Christians from the extreme right who reject the religious ethos in favor of capitalist ethos. It is the same Christian or right-wing nuts who seeks to discredit the threat of global warming. It also claims the threat of climate change is alarmist, they called it. Their word, not mine. And fears that efforts to clamp down on emissions will hurt the poor, when in fact the only ones that will hurt are, are Fortune 500 corporations. Can I get a witness? So in reality, in reality, climate change will have the greatest effect on people living on less than a dollar a day who cannot adapt to higher temperatures. They can't go out and buy an air conditioner because there are no air conditioners. They can't go to Home Depot. There are no Home Depots or Lowe's or anything else. Conservative evangelicals are not even concerned with dwindling biodiversity nor with the destruction of the ecosystem, nor with rampant pollution, global warming, and the numerous other environmental challenges we face as human beings. Rather, they, with the business community, are only concerned with the bottom line. The future, to them, is irrelevant. Unless, of course, we're talking about government debt. Therefore, the biblical command to protect the environment that I just read is quietly but continuously swept under the rug. Point number four out of five. War. This is an easy one. War. Peter just quits data on me for a second. Here we go. Okay, the first verse for war, as I was about to say, excuse me. You have heard it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, this is Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, let him have your cloak, uh, turn to him the other also. Turn to him the other also, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. And from that same sermon on the mount, 
same gospel, Matthew. This time from chapter 5, verses 43 through 45. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. So that you may be sons of your Father. As a religious and political movement, Christian fundamentalists have defined themselves as a party of opposition rather than that of love, grace, and mercy. Some, some of the scholars are erroneously calling this a third great awakening, even though it is different from the, for, from the other two real ones. This one is full of contempt disguised as piety towards those whose understanding of religion fails to meet their lofty standards. Yeah, right. While past great awakenings have looked inward, seeing sin within the conflict itself, like normal Christians do, this new awakening looks outward and sees sin in the wider culture. The culture, which is secular, is evil, while the church is sacred. This is why modern religious fundamentalism gravitates towards xenophobia, homophobia, sexism, and on and on. Fear and disgust are its motivating factors. This fundamentalism uh, inclines some uh, religious people towards a preemptive war of religion and a strong disgust that unfortunately sometimes culminates in violence towards Muslims and towards gay people. Oddly enough, the Christian tradition has developed a theory of, quote, just war, developed by uh, a gentleman by the name of Thomas Aquinas, a Catholic scholar from a thousand years ago. Just war, which, as the way he wrote it, can, which condemns war except when all other options have been exhausted and there is just treatment of prisoners with a specific condemnation of torture. If only one of the past two Christian presidents, Barack Obama and George W. Bush, if only one of the past two had listened to that or bothered to sit down and read it. Fifth and last, the other thing that the fundamentalists get wrong, can't get it straight, Another simple little word, women. The verse, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. Although the uh, religious right often claims the Bible supports their absurd ideas about gender roles, such as sexist claims, have been thoroughly debunked by modern theologians. Generally, when you'll hear an explanation of why women belong in the home, it'll rely on a misreading of one of the Apostle Paul's doctrines. In contrast to Paul, Christ rarely concerned himself with sexual mores, although he clearly was against divorce. Christ was far more concerned with fighting oppression and injustice. Fundamentalists want to keep women submissive and subservient, but Jesus, the true gospel of Jesus, won't let them. In Luke, for instance, Jesus is blessed by a priestess named Anna. He praises a woman who stands up to a judge and demands justice. It's also worth noting that at a time when women could not testify in a court of law, all four resurrection stories have women arriving first at Jesus' tomb. 
Jesus talks with a Samaritan woman at a well, even though Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans back in those days. And he praises Mary Magdalene for listening to his words, just for listening. For a reference on that, see Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now, these verses are powerful, and I believe they should be carefully, carefully considered. I'm becoming increasingly concerned that Christianity and religion in general is represented by its most, most ultra-conservative fundamentalist clients, uh, pardon me, fundamentalist elements. Remember that even Karl Marx drew his inspiration for the famous quote, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs, from the, from the example of the early church, in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Karl Marx, he pulled, it right, he pulled communism right out of the Bible. But once the moral pot shots are finished, back and forth between the communists and the uh, capitalists, once the pot shots are being finished being fired, we all have to face the fundamental and aching deprivation of having been born. We can continue to have a fun time berating those who believe the Bible explains science, if that's what you want to do. The Christian message doesn't contradict science, and nor is it concerned with American politics. Ultimately, Christianity is about transcending politics and fighting for social and economic justice. Think of, for example, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, or Malcolm X, all of whom were influenced by their religion to change the world. Jesus saw how oppression and oppressors consumed the world. He has, as always, sided with the oppressed, as do I. This uh, Johnny Come Lately uh, skewed fundamentalism that I'm writing about, uh, messed up Christianity, is radically new and far removed from true Christianity. True Christianity offers us a far superior doctrine, one of social justice, of love, and of unconditional equality. When we practice all these, we are following Christ regardless of religious denomination, regardless of it. Makes no difference in God's eyes. Thanks for taking the time to hear me out. F feel free to leave any comments below that you like. Keep them ready, G, please. If you care to, visit my website at www.pcmatl.org. That's Progressive Christian Ministries of Greater Atlanta. And drop me a 10 or a 20 spot in the collection basket. All the money goes directly into the ministry. I, it's, it, this is not my personal spending money or anything like that. I have money coming in from another source. This is all to spread the gospel. This is all to help feed the land that's hungry and homeless. And to save up some money to replace my broken old piano. Thanks very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day. Shalom.